once said that it is difficult to find news in poetry, and yet men, and I would say women, die miserably every day because of a lack of what's found there. And so I always surprise people as a mathematician as I start with poetry. It was almost 30 years ago, 25 plus years ago, that Maya Angelou looked into the face of America and said, lift up your eyes upon this day breaking for you. Give birth again to the dream. Women, children, men, take it, this dream, into the palms of your hands, mold it into the image of your most public self, sculpt it into the shape of your most private need. Here on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face and say simply, very simply with hope, good morning. Good morning to the Air Force Academy. Give her a round of applause, please, for poetry, for poetry. <clears throat> Several years ago, the president of Stanford was talking to presidents from around the country at an American Council on Education conference, and he asked, listen in a lecture before they begin to fade out. And that is my question, first question for you. How long do people tend to listen in lectures before they begin to wonder mentally? What would you say? Five minutes? Four minutes? Anybody else? Depends on the speaker, good. Anybody else? So since you've told me four or five minutes, I've got about two more minutes and you're gonna start fading. Is that right? <laughs> I tell you that because more and more in education, people are finding ways to change the structured lecture approach. Because even the neuroscientists will tell you that the most focused and disciplined of people can't focus for more than about 20 minutes. Now that doesn't mean that you don't come back to the subject, but you, you, you tend to go back and forth. And so I begin with stories. If I gave you math theories, you'd go to sleep, most of you. How many of you love math? Let me see your hands. It's very interesting. How many of you love to read? Let me see your hands. Okay, all right. Um, if I give you stories, you may listen. I begin with stories about my parents. Each of us is the product of our childhood experiences. Whether you know it or not, much of what you do today has been influenced by what happened to you when you were 12 years old, without you even realizing it. And so my mother always told the story of growing up in a small town outside, a little country town outside of Montgomery called Wetumpka. And she said that as a child, she had the choice of working as a child maid or working in a hot cotton field after school. And she decided she wanted to see how rich people live. That would, of course, be rich whites. And she said the, the defining characteristic of that house was that people were educated, and there was a library in the home at the time. And at that time, there was no public library for children of color. And the only book my mother had really seen really was the Bible, a wonderful book. And the woman of the house was kind enough to say, Maggie, when you finish your work, you can go into the library and read. And mother would do just that. And she'd say, take the book home. When you finish, you come back and we can talk about it. And all of a sudden, mother's girlfriends became very upset with her because they would say, Maggie, why are you reading that book? This is not school time. Why don't you just come out and play? And she began to understand the growing difference between herself and her girlfriends. And here was the problem. Here was the challenge. She said the more she read, the better a reader she became. And the more proficient a reader she became, the more she enjoyed the experience. And the more she enjoyed reading, the more reading she did. The problem with her girlfriends, she said, was that they never read enough to become excited about reading. You never like doing something that's really hard to do if you don't get better at it. And they push the book aside and say, it's not interesting. Well, obviously, anything that is really tough to do is rarely going to be seen as interesting. And for my mother, that experience inspired her to become a teacher of English. She got a chance to go on to college and work their way through college. And um, she always said, teachers touch all of us, humanity. And she liked the idea of focusing on the humanities because it allowed her to put her own life in perspective. But it also allowed her to learn how to express herself clearly in writing. And, and people would say, that's an unusual little girl. Well, it, was, it was because she was reading so much. And I tell you that story for a number of reasons. You'll hear that you'll understand it in a minute.
her eyes were watching God, and you get goosebumps as you begin ships at a distance, have every man's wish on board. For some, they come in with the tide. For others, they sail forever on the horizon, never out of sight, never landing, until the watcher turns his head away in resignation, his dreams mocked to death by time. That is the life of men. And my mother would say, and women. And the point that Hurston was making, the point that my mother made as an English teacher, was that there are two groups of people in our society. There are people who are fortunate, blessed to have dreams come true. People like you. All of you represent the best of America. And then there are people whose dreams are, in the words of Langston Hughes, forever deferred. And the fundamental difference between those who have the dreams fulfilled and those whose dreams never come to fruition Education. Where would any of you be if you were not fortunate to be getting this education? If you're a student, a cadet, if you're a faculty member, if you're from other places. And so there's my first story. My second story is my father who grew up in a little country town outside of Selma, Alabama. And he would always say, boy, you're so lucky somebody drives you to school. When I was growing up, I had to walk five miles to school every day. I got so tired of my daddy telling me that story. I finally said, dad, that's why your feet are so big. All right. To which he responded, don't you get smart with me, boy. But I remember those two stories of those kids who grew up in rural towns and poor families. And the, the essence of the stories is this. When I think about who I am today, I don't think about being the president of a university with students from 100 countries. I think about being the product of those people, my parents. All of you know that. You're the products of your parents and your grandparents and other people and people who worked hard so you could be here today. And so a part of leadership, as we think about embracing the challenges, is to understand history and the context. How did you get here? What are the challenges you face? Who will you be? You cannot fully understand who you will be if you don't understand where you've come from, how you got here, and what that context is. Now, the interesting part about those stories is that years later, when I became a 12-year-old kid, I'm sitting in the back of church. And my parents have insisted that I go and listen to this guy talk. And I'm a rebellious little kid. I don't want to go. They placate me with the two things I liked most, math and food. All right? So I'm sitting there doing my math, and I'm eating M&Ms, the good kind with the peanuts. You know the kind, right? I'm getting smarter and fatter all the time, all right? And we Southerners like those cheeks, so it was okay. So I'm listening, and all of a sudden, this guy at the lectern says, if the children participate in this peaceful protest, all of America will understand that even our children know the difference between right and wrong. And our children will be able to go to better schools. And I look up when he said that, better schools. Because you see, all of my life, even as the child of teachers, I could not have new books. The books that I had to use in my classes were books that had been discarded by white schools after they no longer used them. We had these torn up books with brown paper bags around them, and it was debilitating to say the least. And when my parents would say, well, we'll, we'll buy his books, no, because everybody had to have the same kind of books. So there we were being told every day in America, in the 50s and 60s, we were not good enough to have just regular books. And so I got really excited when I heard about this possibility that I could go to another school. We had some good teachers, but the schools didn't have the resources. And when I was told white kids are smarter than black kids, you hear that all the time in my childhood, you, that they are at this level, I kept thinking, no, to me, smart meant you were willing to work really hard. You are excited about ideas. You would do whatever it takes to be the best. And I wanted that chance. And so amazingly, I look up and I say, who is that guy? And of course, his name was Martin King, Martin Luther King. And I go home and I tell my parents, I've got to go. I've got to march. It's a peaceful protest. I want to go. And my parents look at me and they say, absolutely not. And I say, wait a minute. You made me go. I didn't want to go. Who wants to go to church in the middle of the week? Um, you told me to listen, and I listened some, and I heard him say this. You guys are hypocrites. Now, at that time, cadets, you did not tell your parents they were hypocrites. My daddy said, go to your room, boy, and I knew I was in trouble. But the next morning, they came in, and they had not slept. And in fact, it was the first time I had seen my parents looking as if they had been crying. And they said, it wasn't that we didn't trust you. We didn't trust the people who would be over you. Because if you march, 
You'll have to deal with the dogs and the fire hoses and then being put in jail. And we don't know how people will treat you in jail. You're 12. But they said, if you want to go, we will put you in God's hands. And you will be okay. And I did go. Now, I, I must tell you, my students over the years have said, you must have been really courageous to be willing to do that. Let me be very clear. I was not a courageous kid, all right? I was a fat little nerdy kid. Did you get that? The only thing I'd ever attacked was a math problem. Did you get that? If a fight, unlike you maybe, when a fight drew, I was running the other way. So I don't want to give the idea that I was, but what I did know was that I wanted a better education, that I did understand education transforms lives. And so I did go, and it was scary, and it was frightening. Uh, and amazingly, the police chief, it just so happened, there's a picture in the Smithsonian now, it was in the Washington Post the other day, uh, and it says also in my, in my new book on holding fast to dreams, and interestingly, the picture by chance has me as a 12-year-old. And everybody says, you look so mean. I said, I was scared. You know, you're not gonna look happy when you're going to jail, right? And when you're gonna face dogs. And we got up to City Hall, and the police chief, the very, very well-known Bull Connor, looked at me and said, what do you want, little Negro? And I said what we had been taught to say, which was, um, we want our freedom to pray here that we can get a better education. That was it. We just wanted to be able to kneel and pray at City Hall so that America could see children knew they needed a better education. He was so angry because the TV cameras were there. He turned me around and he spat in my face and he threw me into the police wagon. And we went off to jail and we spent a week there. And it was a, an empowering experience and a miserable experience. We were treated like animals. We didn't have enough restrooms. We slept on the floor. Children as young as seven and eight were there. And it was, it was something you never forget. It, 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 it makes me think about uh, Maya Angelou's, uh, the, it, it makes me think about the dreams of the possibility. Because in the middle of the week, Dr. King came with all of our parents outside of the jailhouse, children in jail because they wanted a better education. And he said this, what you do this day will have an impact on children who have yet to be born. We didn't understand the profundity, but somehow we knew it made such, such a mark on all of us in that. In the jail and our parents who were trying not to cry outside. Imagine your children in jail just for peaceful protest. Now here is the critical point. Shortly after that, we had several amazing things happen. There was a march on Washington, you'll see in history. Um, and several things happened. This was 1963. Interestingly enough, within a matter of weeks of our being in jail, the city was seeing that it was being looked at by all of America, and it opened its doors. What do I mean by opening its doors? And this is something you wouldn't fully appreciate. Anybody who is over, anybody who is at least um, was born before 63 would have a sense of this. Now, let me ask the question. Is there anybody in here who was in, who was in the world in the early 60s? Let me look around. You look good, you really do. <laughs> but for most of you, when I tell you that I could go into Birmingham, into the city, and never see anyone in any position of power, not, even, not a policeman, not a fireman, not somebody at the cash register who was black, every position of power was held by white guys. And, and so we wanted just to be a part of American society. And so the, the city began to open up, and when it did, others became very angry and probably the most dramatic thing that happened, really traumatic, was that I'm sitting in church in September, and we get this call, and our sister church had just been bombed. And my friends, uh, little girls, 14 years old, one of my classmates, one little kid younger than that, just by chance had been in the bathroom primping before, in white dresses, before church began. They could not have known that someone had put a bomb under the commode. They were blown to pieces. And for years, the children of Baltimore, the black children of Baltimore, had nightmares. Because one of the kids, my old friend, couldn't find her. Her dad had given her a ring that morning. They found that hand. And we had nightmares about a hand. And so it was what I suppose people who go through war go through.
Now, I tell you that not because we saw ourselves as victims, but the fear was this. If they will bomb our church, where are we safe? If they will bomb our church, where are we safe? And interestingly enough, in that same period, if anybody was in the world, so many things happened from um, our beloved President John Kennedy was killed. And I'll never forget, everybody knows exactly where you are when things like that happen. I'll never forget, you know, his, his courage in talking and speaking on our behalf. It was the first time we had heard a president saying the Negro children need to have the right to get a good education. And they killed him. And so all of a sudden we said, all oh, the hope is gone. Oh my God, all the hope is gone. And I'll never forget that. I was, that was, I turned 13, I was in the 10th grade, I skipped school, I told you I was a fat little nerdy kid, and, and we were just saying, no hope. And amazingly, what happened was this. Within a matter of a year, after the March on Washington, legislation came about, if you look at history, you'll see the Civil Rights Act. You'll see the Higher Education, Civil Rights Act of 1964, Higher Education Act of 1965, Voting Rights Act of 1965, and all of a sudden, America was never the same. Now, let me prove that to you. What percent of students do you think were, of Americans, were in college, or let's say had graduated from college in 1965? What percent would you think? Take a guess. What'd you say? What percent? 30? Somebody else? What percent? 10 percent? Somebody else? 50 percent? 50 or 15? 15 percent? Anybody else? Why am I asking you that question? Why do I ask you that question rather than simply giving you the answer? Don't let me leave the academy saying you're risk adverse, all right? Surely you know the importance of taking a chance, right? So why, do, why am I asking you these questions? Why am I asking you this? Huh? To engage you. If I ask you the question, then you have to think about well, what might be the answer. If it's TV up here and you're just passively looking at it, I'll say it and you'll forget it. But when you give a response, 15%, 30% or whatever, and all of a sudden it comes up and you get the answer, you will you remember it, okay? It's about the active learning, the interaction that I'm trying to get, to engage you. Only 10% of Americans in 1964, 65 had earned a college degree. And at that time, everything was broken down into black and white. I can prove it to you. Anybody who was born in the world at that time, how many people in the room remember something called black and white TV? Anybody remember black and white TV? Now to all of you, you're like my students, you'll say, what do you mean, TV's always been in color? No, no, it was not in color. In fact, when we finally got a color TV in the 60s, uh, I thought it meant the TV where you had colored people on the TV. <laughs> who could imagine color? It's like what you would think about high definition. You know, if you hadn't seen high definition before, when you say HD, what does that mean, right? That's how much the world has changed. But at that time, all the statistics were in black and white. And so here's what happened. So about, 11, about literally only about 2 or 3% of blacks had gotten the college degree, but only 11% of whites had gotten the college degree. What is the point? Most Americans in the 50s and 60s never thought their children would go to college because college was for very privileged families, heavily white men, some women. Okay, now let me ask a question. Who in the room is first generation college? Raise your hands, let me see. It's a big deal, it's a huge deal. Let me tell you why it's such a big deal. In the 60s, the probability of somebody who had not come from a family of education, college education, the probability that that person would get a four year degree was about 10%. What do you think the percent is today? 60? Come on. It's still only 10%. It's still only 10% for those in the bottom quarter economically. It's one of the challenges we face as an American democracy that poor children of any race are still least likely to get a college degree. If you're from the top quarter of our society economically, it's well over 80%. Now, we talked about the 60s. To, and the, the idea of 10%. What percent of, of Americans today have a college degree? 40, 60, it's now we're up to 30%. Now when I say that to my friends of every race, the first thing they say is, that couldn't be true. Everybody I know has a college degree, duh. Lawyers know lawyers. <laughs> doctors know doctors. 
officers in the Air Force know officers in the Air Force, right? You know, teachers know teachers, and plumbers who probably make more money than most of us know plumbers. So the fact is that most educated people don't realize most American families have never had anyone graduate from college. Now, why is it important for me to tell you that? You are our leaders already. And of those to whom much is given, much is required. You're the most blessed in our society. You were able not just to finish high school, but to do well enough academically that you could come to this fine institution. And you had the values that's been inculcated over the years from families to say, and you're so privileged, you should think about the noble cause of serving your country as leaders. And I want you as leaders, while you're in the military and when you're out, to be thinking about what is our responsibility as a society to those children of any background who are the least of us, who have the least when thinking about the privileges of that type. Now, the fact is, what Dr. King taught so many of Americans was this, that tomorrow can be different from today. That today doesn't have to be the name of the story for the rest of your lives. And I want you to think about that notion, that just because when you were 19 or 21, and, and that bottom quarter of Americans are not getting a chance to move, doesn't mean it has to be that way a generation from now. That's what I want you to think about. And that's, that's the case for all the people. I will tell you, the challenge we face is that any group in power, I don't care who they are, won't necessarily feel that sense of urgency. Let me prove it to you. How many of you have read about, do you have in your curriculum anything on the GI Bill? Do you read about the GI Bill? Do you know when that was, what, what period of time that was? When was that? In the 40s, right? 1944. Who was the president? FDR. All right. Faculty, let's do a little more history here on the GI Bill. Because let me tell you something. When he was fighting to get that done, it was not, you would think, well, everybody's going to say, of course veterans should go to college. Of course they will. No. In fact, there was one group who fought the president, President Roosevelt, in the notion of veterans coming to college. Let me tell you what these people said. They said, if veterans are allowed into our universities, our universities will become, quote, academic hobo jungles. Now, who said that? What group fought most vigorously against veterans coming to college? Who do you think? What'd you say? Well, they were college graduates, but what group of college graduates? They were universities, but who in the universities? University presidents. And it was led by the president of our most prestigious, the president of Harvard and the president of the University of Chicago. Liberally educated people, very good people. Don't miss my point. They were good people. What they thought was that if you were a veteran, you should go into a trade but that universities were for people of privilege. Why? Because that's all they had seen. That's all they had seen, you see? But what happened? Veterans came back, and within several years, two million had come in and shown that when you've been through all of what they had been through, and you're trying to raise your children, you have the discipline to do anything. And amazingly, they showed America that regular people, now it was still mainly white guys, but there were some minorities and there were some women there. And what we showed America was people of all types could get an education and help our society. And so when 1965 came, what Congress looked at was whether GI Bill worked. Maybe regular Americans can do it. And that's how we've had the evolution of the American middle class. For every race, the first person goes to college, people look to see. How does that person do? When that person does well, they want to become like that person. The biggest challenge we face today when thinking about higher education before I get to something on STEM is this. Uh, if you are between the ages, anybody between the ages of 35 and, six, and 60s, raise your hands if you're between 35 and 60s, okay? Well, you're the best educated in the world if you're an American. You're second best educated in the world behind Norway. Now, is anybody in the room between 25 and 34? You are not as smart as that group. I hate to tell you that. Right? <laughs> I say it jokingly because I'm trying to get away from that word smart. But you're certainly not with the same standing in the world. Those who were older are second best educated in the world. If you're between 25 and 34, you're number 12 in the world. 11 countries are ahead. Why? Somebody tell me. Why do you think that is? 
the, the other countries, we all have a lot of people going to college. The difference is, in other countries, when they go to college, they're graduating. 50% of the people who start college in this country do not graduate. It's moving towards 50%. And especially if you're from low income, if you're minority, if you're in certain disciplines, in contrast here, I've looked at your data. Most people graduate. And there's a reason. You have a sense of community here. You've got some nurturing here. You've got all those things, and you're fortunate, and you've got certain academic preparation, and you've got a goal. You've got this noble goal, and you're here in this focused area. You can't go out and party in the city. You, you are here. It's very clear. When I got here, you were in the mountains, all right? <laughs> You're not going anywhere. Wait. <laughs> and it's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Now, I come from a campus that is a, we like to say we are a nerdy campus. We love that fact. In fact, we are the National Collegiate Cybersecurity Champions. Give us a big round of applause for that. Very proud of that. And one of the reasons we are so nerdy is that many of my students of all races come from intelligence families and military families. You know, if you know the Baltimore-Washington corridor, my campus is between D.C. and Baltimore, you know that many families retire in that area. And a large numbers of those sons and daughters and spouses sometimes are on our campus, number one. And number two, many of the people in that corridor are in the intelligence community. In fact, we are the leading feeder at this point to the National Security Agency. Give us a big round of applause for that. It's a big deal. So we have about 1,100 graduates there at NSA. And what you may not know, best-in-class education, K-12, involves children getting a chance to work in the field while they're still in high school. Many of my students come in having worked two years at NSA. They already have cyber, they have, they have the security clearances. They've worked in a lot of math. As a mathematician, you can get a lot of math done when you're 18 years old, 17 years old. And um, they are very connected to cybersecurity. Of the 100 companies on our campus started by students and faculty, about 25 are cybersecurity companies. We work a lot with Northrop Grumman, who's helped to start some companies, but a lot. And the National Security Agency has a big research center on our campus. So imagine that kind of environment. I love selling, telling people, uh, most important, that the students are focused. And we are now, we are a predominantly white campus, but we're becoming more and more like America. We are early 50-some percent white, and then we have about 40-some percent of color. Uh, the, largest, the largest minority group actually is Asian, of different Asian backgrounds, from Indian, Chinese, Korean, or whatever. And then we've got perhaps almost 2,000 blacks on the campus. We are the leading predominantly white campus in sending blacks on the PhDs. And more important than that, for any institution in America, we are number one in having our graduates who are African-American go on and complete the MD, PhD by a factor of two to one. Harvard is number two, but, and, and literally we have produced twice as many as Harvard. Give us a huge round of applause for that, okay? So why do I give you all that? I give you all that for this reason. Anybody who knows our country and our challenges will tell you the question of what's happening to those at the bottom is important because they are part of our society and either they will be helping us with taxes and all of that or they're going to be in prison and we're using our taxes to pay for them, all right? That we've got violence in our cities, that they need support in different ways. But then the other point is that the future of our country is largely also connected to our ability to protect ourselves. And a part of that protection, part of our standing in the country will be how well educated we are. It will be, quite frankly, how well educated we are broadly across disciplines and in STEM areas. And when I begin talking about STEM, the first thing I say is this. Jim Collins, in his book, Good to Great, said, um, we must talk about the genius of the and versus the tyranny of the or. OK? The genius of the and versus the tyranny of the or. What do I mean? I'm going to talk about STEM. I'm going to talk about great passion with STEM. But make no mistake, at the same time I'm saying the humanities, <clears throat> the social sciences, the arts are more important than ever. Give me a round of applause for the arts, humanities, and social sciences. Round of applause, because it's important to say that. Because it's in those disciplines, whether it's philosophy, literature, the arts teach us who we are, help us to reflect on who we are as a society. At the same time, everything around us has something to do with STEM. As a mathematician, everything I'm, I'm constantly thinking in math terms. I am looking at the beauty of this architecture and the geometric form. I'm looking at each of you and thinking about things involving quantitative terms, OK? The fact is that when I ask American audiences how many of them love math, 
The response I normally get is, how can you put math and love in the same sentence? I get that all the time, okay? When I'm in other countries, uh, we have people who come to our country because we, are, we believe in what we call inclusive excellence. So we're working to get more women into technology areas. There has been a 50% decline in women majoring in computer science since the 80s. We had gotten up to 36% in the 80s. We assumed that by now we'd be half and half. We're down to under 20%. One of the real reasons is K-12 focused in the 80s and before up to about 90 on girls in technology. We thought we had solved the problem of the paucity of women in technology, not realizing you don't solve a, a century-long problem in a decade or two, because attitudes change. As soon as we stopped putting money into girls in technology, quite frankly, the numbers went down. Probably the most exciting pre-college program we have is called, it's for middle school girls from suburban areas to urban areas, and it's, um, it's called uh, coding and yoga. Did you get that? Coding and yoga. You know who funds that program? The National Security Agency. All right, when people laugh, then that, they, and they are, because the research shows yoga teaches discipline and assertiveness and confidence, and the girls have sometimes not been given that kind of confidence, and if you're gonna be really in cybersecurity, it's not just about protecting, you've gotta know how to be assertive. All of the curriculum now in cybersecurity, when you look at it, it is focused on being, to protect is also to be able to actually attack. And so teaching girls to have that confidence to deal with the boys who have been accustomed to coding all the time is extremely important. And so, and we see those girls leaving those programs, becoming ambassadors, as we talk about a center for women in IT. Now, the challenge is this. Anytime people see one situation, they tend to think that's just the way it is. So, a lot of people in my community thought, well, blacks are just supposed to get the raggedy books. Um, a lot of people in computer science courses will say, well, girls just don't like coding. Well, it's not about people not liking something. It's not about them not having the ability. It's about the exposure, the expectations. If you get a chance, I want you to watch my TED Talk on changing the culture of STEM in America. What do we call the first year of STEM courses in universities, academies? What do we call those courses? Weed out courses. Even the National Science Foundation, Gateway Weed Out Courses. And so I had the privilege of chairing the National Academies Committee on underrepresentation in STEM. Uh, looking first, I'm talking about particularly women in the technology areas. Women do as well in the life sciences and physical sciences in college. We even have 40% or more getting PhDs. But when you get to the faculties, you see far fewer women there. Uh, if you've not looked at the advanced program faculty from the National Science Foundation, it is specifically focused on increasing the number of women faculty in STEM areas. And it comes out of a study done at MIT that shows that women there, who are by far the best in the world, were getting much less support years ago in startup packages, in salaries, in support, as the men. And it showed in different ways. And so NSF has a big program, and we have one of those grants. I decided to be the PI on the advanced program grant, and it surprised people. They said, you're a man. This is a program for women. And my point is this. Men should be as concerned about the paucity of women in STEM as white should be about the paucity of minorities in STEM, because both are American issues, that we're all connected across races, across gender, across so many boundaries. And it's because of that program, my campus has gone from about 12% women in tenure track and tenure faculty positions to about 35%. Not where we need to go, but further along than we were. Now, why do I tell you all of that? The study that I did with the National Academy of Sciences was shocking. It didn't surprise us that only 20% of blacks and Hispanics and a smaller number of Native Americans were, who started with a major in science or engineering, graduated with a major in science and engineering. What was really stunning was to look at the statistics for whites and Asians. So here's my question. What percent of whites in America who begin with a major in science or engineering actually graduate with a bachelor's in those areas? 50, somebody else. You know, you all really are risk adverse. We, <laughs> huh? 65, 70. 70, it's only 32%. Only 32% of whites who begin with a major in science or engineering graduate with a major in that. What about the Asian population? What percent? I usually get a 90 from somebody. He said 80, huh? Right? It's only 41%, okay? 
So the first response from the commission that we had, and this was uh, scientists and engineers from MIT and Harvard to Howard University, to University of Texas El Paso, to Miami-Dade Community College. It was the American spectrum in higher education. And in community colleges, in comprehensives, in research universities, in academies, in every part of higher education, it is a fact that the majority of students who begin in the discipline usually don't make it. And the response from the commission, from faculty was, it is a K through 12 problem. Because you see, in America, we are very comfortable blaming someone else. So universities blame high schools. High schools blame elementary schools. Elementary schools blame the family, and the husband says it's the wife's part of the family that's the problem, all right? We all blame somebody. But we did something that was really transformational. We said, wait a minute, let's look in the mirror. Innovation is about looking in the mirror and saying, what can we do to change today's practice for something in the future? And this is what we found. The higher, now listen, this is counterintuitive, very important to you. The higher the SATs or AP courses, the higher the number of courses with fives. By the way, I wrote those questions. If you don't like those tests, I wrote those questions before you were born. Math SAT, A, B, and B, C, calc, mm -hmm, I did. So when people say, oh, minorities, you know, blacks don't do it. No, 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 I wrote those questions. It's about preparation, all right? It's about preparation and support that people get. But the higher the scores, the fives, and the perfect math scores, the more prestigious the university, the greater the probability often it will be that the student will remain in science or engineering to the bachelor's, through the bachelor's. Did you get that? And the first response again was, well, it's because you can go, and go into business and make more money on Wall Street. But when we looked at the data, the fact is that very talented student who had gotten A's in high school, who had fives and perfect scores, takes that chemistry course or that calculus-based physics course or whatever and gets a C. And any A student who gets a C is going to run the other way. Because for my science faculty in the room, the humanities faculty are a bit more nurturing anyway than we are. We know that. Come on, we know. We are not the warm and fuzzy type. We know that, right? You know, not that there are some good faculty, but the fact is that, and it sh always shocks people because people are always saying, oh, isn't it wonderful? They went to this top Ivy or whatever, but when you go to graduation, primarily the students you see who are getting degrees and going to grad school are students who are parents who come from other countries. On my campus, I asked the freshmen, uh, and these are high achieving kids, how many of you have at least one parent from another country? It was between 45 and 50%. These are Americans now. But there is a reason for that. If it were not for people from other countries throughout the 20th century, we would not be the greatest power in the world. The fact is that throughout the 20th century, and even now, what you found was this. Many of the Nobel laureates, from the sciences to the humanities, had parents who didn't speak English well in New York from European countries. They went to the poor man's Harvard, New, uh, City College, Brooklyn College, and they went on and became Nobel laureate. Why? Hunger. Hunger. When you look at the highest achieving people in our society in STEM right now, for every race, for every race, you will see a, a connection to the migration to this country and this hunger saying, I'm in America. My parents sacrificed to get here. I've got to do everything I can to excel. And there's something inspiring about that. But there's also something challenging about that. My passion is that a child in Baltimore or a child in Colorado Springs of any race should have as high a probability of being superb in education in STEM as people from anywhere else. Give me a round of applause for the idea of children out of the soil of America doing well. Give me a round of applause for that. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. And that is not to take away from the wonderful human beings who are here from other places. Because if you look at the Baltimore, Washington, Carter, we've got probably more PhDs per capita than any place in the life sciences because all of the National Institutes of Health are in Maryland, except for one in North Carolina. The National Security Agency, the NASA people, the, the NIST people, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, all these PhDs and disproportionately large numbers were educated in undergrad school in other places. Then they came to the best in the world grad school in this country. Now, why is that important to you? You, in many cases, have been able to do well academically, and to do well in those areas. But here's the challenge, and this is where the TED Talk comes in. Changing the culture in STEM means that we all need to look in the mirror to the colleagues, and I'm gonna be talking to you later 
Uh, on my campus, for years, we thought that prestige meant most people could not succeed in the disciplines. So except for those who were the very best, often Asian and some whites, others were not making it. And we started looking at what we were doing with minority kids to see what can we learn that could be helpful. And so when I talk about the four pillars of college success in STEM, in that TED talk, we talk about the high expectations, building community, the idea that it takes researchers to produce researchers, and then the nurturing and relationship among the students and between students and faculty. And if you look at the 60 Minutes piece on that UMBC, on the MAV program, you will sense something that is connected to what you do in the military. For example, the summer before the freshman year, they do have boot camp. And I'll tell you something that had me in hot water. I had more letters criticizing us because the students cannot have their phones during boot camp. Look at your faces, you go, what? How is that possible? And people are saying, how could you be so cruel? They need their cell phone. You go, what? No cell phone? What is that about, right? Right, well, let me tell you what was really the redeeming quality, because I got all these nasty, even from some elected officials saying, that's not fair, that's not the American way. Who do you think made the recommendation that we take the phones away from the students during boot camp in the week, during the week? Who do you think made that recommendation? The students. You know what they said? If you take the phone away, they will build community among themselves. As long as they have their phone, they're talking to their best friends from high school and their mothers, who's always calling them anyway, right? You know, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You know, and that's the point, that it took the students to say, if you really want us to build community, force us to support each other and to look at our strengths, our challenges, and to learn how to work with each other. And it made all the difference in the world. And that program now that started for minorities has students of all races, and the idea is you have criteria, so you have white students who want to understand issues of underrepresentation. You got women who are saying we want to get more women into technology, and so you got Americans of all types working to make a difference. And on the other side, and I'll talk with faculty later about this, we have redesigned courses. We've put a lot of money into reading. If you get a chance, look at the Chemistry Discovery Center. Much more emphasis on active learning, use of technology, real-time feedback, teaching them how to teach each other. The best education comes when I've had the calculus and I teach somebody else. It's one thing to be able, students, to get an A yourself. It's another thing to be able to help somebody else grasp a concept. That's when you have a deeper level of understanding. You get it? So what I want you to think about is this passion we must have for helping more students of all types to believe that tomorrow can be better than today. And then in the STEM areas, I want more people to be thinking about how do we help Americans understand it's not just STEM for a few people who are really smart. It's about all of us being able to do much more. You know, I'll tell you, we stopped using the word smart. My youngest freshman ever was nine years old. I get a lot of kids through the calculus sequence before they're 13, okay? They come out of the Hopkins Center for Talented Youth. They have all races, boys and girls. But they wouldn't see themselves. They've been fortunate to go through homeschooling, and they're bored in school. But the number one quality of those students, two qualities, curiosity and hard work. Nothing takes the place of hard work. I went through school early, not because I'm better than anybody else, but because I was the hard work. So the word we use on my campus comes from our Chesapeake Bay Retriever, who is our mascot. And what's his name? True Grit. And we say that UMBC is the house of grit. And that means perseverance and hard work and getting knocked down and getting back up, resilience and believing in yourself and never, never, never giving up. When you give me a student who has that grit, even if they don't have a strong background, all things are possible. We must teach Americans that it's not about somebody being naturally smart, no. It's about who's willing to put in the blood, sweat and tears to make the difference. And I want you to use your stories from your family members who helped you to get here. Because somewhere in your family, there's been that grit. Every race, at some point, people were not privileged. And yet they were pushing because they wanted a better way for their children. I was talking to one of my hosts who was saying to me, nothing is more important to him than his children. The idea of doing whatever you, and that's what your families have done for you. I, I, want, to quit, I want to close, because I want time for questions, with the story about the voting process. And my, my point is this, the way we think about ourselves as a society, the language that we use, the values that we hold, 
the way we interact with each other determines not only who we are today, but who we will be tomorrow as individuals, as an academy, as a society. My hope is, is not so much that we tell people who to vote for. You vote for whomever you want. When you know you're thinking critically, you make those decisions. People make those decisions. You know, it was Justice Brandeis who said the most important position in American society is that of citizen. The idea of learning how to present your arguments in a rational way with claims that you can prove, the idea of respecting others in a way that you're learning how to listen and interact, and then this notion that you believe in yourself most, that you're thinking about the public good. That's what you're being taught here. You're thinking about the public good and society, but, but I want you to think about how you can encourage and support others to understand they have a role too. I asked somebody about leadership, and they said something that was particularly significant. They said, it, it has to be about embracing the problem. You are helping to defend your country, but you're also the role models for so many people who wish they could be in your position right now, in your own communities. Others are saying, wow, he's at the Air Force Academy. She's at the Air Force Academy. And here's what I want you to finally think about. There are stories that can inspire you. My grandmama finally was uh, wanting to vote in 1963, and she could not vote in her town because there was something called the Alabama Literacy Test. Look it up. And what it meant was that whites could sign their names, blacks had to pass a test involving the Constitution. And she took a test the first time, and she failed. And the second time, she and her friends failed. And then she was, and this is about ethics. She did something that some people might question. She said she assigned certain questions to certain friends. She said, you memorize these questions. And they all memorized three or four questions. And then they put them together. And then they had my mama, the English teacher, to train them in learning the Constitution. And they went back. And they took that test, and my grandmama passed. And when she walked in the room, when she walked in my house, she said this, I am a first-class voting American citizen. She was 70 years old. All of her life, she struggled for this country. It took until she was 70. And what is my point when I'm talking to my students? How dare we as Americans don't take our responsibility and vote? because it is the most fundamental of the rights of our democracy. I challenge you, Air Force Academy, to watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. I tell my students, your character has everything to do with who you are when you don't think anybody is watching. What will you do? So thoughts become words, words become actions. Actions become habits. Habits become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. Dreams and values. Air Force Academy, cadets, you are so special. And you can be even better. Thank you all very much. Dr. Hrowski, thank you for your message. Thank you for showing us through your stories and experiences how much education has changed for minorities and how much change still needs to be accomplished and that we all need to have true grit. Thank you. So at this time, I'd like to open up the floor for questions and I will announce the last question as we approach two minutes remaining in the session. And also, if you would like to ask a question, please speak to the, into the microphones like, located to your all's right. And we have time for a few questions, so. Please, questions. I.I. Robbie said that when he was growing up in New York, he was a Nobel laureate in physics, he said, when he was growing up in New York, all of his friends' mothers would say, what'd you learn in school? He said, not my Jewish mother. My Jewish mother said, ask, did you ask, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? Nothing more important in your education than asking good questions. Question, uh-huh. President Browski, thanks for your time and for your talk this morning. Sure. Thank you very much. What are you anticipating uh, out of the Higher Education Act? You mentioned it early on. I know it's coming up for reauthorization. Yeah. Uh, how, what are you anticipating from it? How are you preparing for it? Uh, what does that mean to us today in sure. higher education? Now, I honestly believe across parties, people do recognize the fact that we are the society we are today because more and more people are becoming educated. The other countries are investing more and more in education. I mean, there's no way we can continue to be the most admired nation in the world if we don't have an educated citizenry of all races, quite frankly. And I do believe that we as America will do the right thing. We have to keep educating our children. No choice, okay? All right. Another question from a cadet, please, yes. 
Good afternoon, sir. Cadet 4th Class Kasparovic from Cadet Squadron 8. I had a question for you based on your talking about people from other countries. I'm a second generation immigrant. Yes. My uh, father originally came over from Croatia. Okay. Uh, what's interesting that you said is that we're more motivated into going to college, yes. but from my experience, we were told that we couldn't make it in our old country. I would have never, like, when I told my family back home that I'm coming here to be a pilot, they laughed. Yes. So I think it's interesting that there's maybe different motivations based on your upbringing. Yes. How are we addressing that motivation to it, it, get more it's, people it's, into STEM? It's an excellent point. I mean, the fact is that when people come to this country, they've often come to places that didn't have the freedoms that we have. So they appreciate them more. The challenge we face is that so many children of all races from poor families, whether it's urban or rural, have seen generations of not moving ahead. They don't see that connection between education and that. They may be in schools where they're not getting the resources to do what? To read. If you want a child to learn how to do math, you've got to teach them to think and read. Because you think about it, physics, engineering, chemistry, all those areas require reading skills at the fundamental. And that requires somebody who's saying, you can do it. You can do it, finally. Coming from another country, whatever it is, and you get here and you say, wow, if I can get this education, I can do it, right? But if you're in homes in our country where people haven't seen it, haven't come to believe in it, if you're in a home where nobody has gone to college, it takes more effort to believe it can be done, to have the faith to believe it can be done. And so I think we should all be inspired by people who come, whether it's from Jamaica or from Russia, wherever they come from, they come and my God, they just thrive. They really do. It, there's something inspirational about that. Let me ask you to stand. I'm going to get you to do something. Stand up. Everybody, stand up. Stand up. Stand up. OK, I'm going to say this quote, and I'm going to get you to memorize it. Got to be mindful, OK? I'm going to say it with you two times. You're going to repeat after me, then I'm going to test you on it. You know you're having a test, so you must learn it, right? You cannot be passive. Repeat after me. Thoughts, words, actions, habits, character, destiny. Again, thoughts, words, actions. Habits, character, character. Destiny. destiny. OK, here's the test. Watch your thoughts. They become your Ah, Some of you knew it. Let's just practice one more time. Thoughts, words, words actions, actions, habits, habits character, character, destiny. Here we go. Watch your thoughts. They become your words. Watch your words. They become your actions. Watch your actions. They become your habits. Watch your habits. They become your words. Watch your character becomes your destiny. You get an A plus. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh -huh.